and I guess we'll do a, like a little introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to the second episode of The Realign. Um, today, I am with Angie. Uh, Angie Speaks. Um, I'm going to introduce, first of all, the fact that we are both going to be smoking because we are both smokers, and we decided that we were going to smoke on this thing. So, um, children, do not start smoking. Um, adults, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you can quit if you like, but um, smoking is lots of fun. Um, so you are my second guest on this episode and I'm super happy to have you here. I was actually going to maybe do you Thank like, you. or not have you first or whatever, but I hit Gordon instead. Um, I hope that's not a problem, but and as we were <laughs> just talking before you and Gordon absolutely have to meet. So hopefully Gordon. Can yes. Continue. I've been wanting to for ages. I listened to Rune Soup like so much, yeah. uh, a few years ago. Um, <laughs> We're, so yeah, definitely. We just, I guess we just really recently started talking to each other, like him and I, uh, like last year or something like that before everyone was like, hey, you guys don't talk. What's going on? I'm like, I don't know. Maybe. It, he's know. English, isn't he? he uh, yeah. He lives in Tasmania. Um, on a cool oh, wow. Little, like he's got his own like awesome permaculture little farm and he's like, like running a, a permacultural society or he's the head of it like in Tasmania and. So he's like teaching other people and helping to organize permaculture. It's like the coolest, you know, if, if you were going to do anything that was hobbit ish, that's exactly what you would do. Um, yeah, definitely. And he's, oh, a, that's, I mean, it's cool. That's cool. But it's like a shame he left England though, because it would have been cool to make another English occult friend. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I think he still counts. Or, well, you should, you should definitely, um, Gordon, if you're watching this. Uh, next time you're in England, hang out with Angie, and maybe I can yes. come too, and we can have coffee. Yeah. Uh, yes, 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 yes. I feel like you don't need any introduction, but you probably do, because not everybody who's been reading me or, or watching my stuff might know who you are. Um, but then lots of people don't know who I am either, so that's okay. Um, so Angie, you have been creating videos and, and currently writing columns for Newsweek as well. Um, You've always been for me this like amazing figure that you cannot really pin down into like one ideological spectrum or another. And you always have felt like so you're someone who's like speaking the truth that everyone is kind of feeling but doesn't know how to say. And then, you know, what I've noticed, of course, this is the Internet. It's the Internet always does this to everybody. When you do say those things, suddenly you get attacked. You know, everyone's like, oh, no, I can't believe she said what I was just thinking. Um <laughs> Or I cannot believe what she said I was afraid to admit I was thinking. Um, so I've, I've seen that happen to you a lot. And I am so happy that you have like survived all of this. Not just survived, but become uh, someone I look up to. Uh, someone that I'm always oh. like, wow, I'm so glad. Like, how the fuck does she survive this stuff? I wish I could survive it too. You know, and so oftentimes <laughs> when things are politically contentious for me, especially, I mean, it's a little bit better now that I'm not on social media any longer. Um, and you still are, right? You're still, you still to do Twitter and all of those things, correct? Occasionally, yeah. <laughs> Oof, I'm so sorry. I, so I, again, I have no <laughs> idea how you, you know, I have like little automated postings that like every single time I write something, Twitter shows it and Facebook shows it. And that's the closest I can get to dealing with the the pixel mobs i guess um mm, but yeah, yeah. you survived that for a long time so and one of the other things I, and i and i talked about this uh before we started that um I, I wanted to talk about how you i mean you know obviously we're not the same at all but one of the things i've always seen in your work is this this trajectory of being from coming from one set of ideological ideas and then taking the truths that are behind those but then dropping off the ideology because it doesn't work any longer um mm -hmm. you know trying to find the uh, you, you know you've mentioned it as universal truths um or or the common ground like that that core truth that's in there that tends to get forgotten in when when a truth raises to the level or arises to the level of ideological certainty you know yeah you can see this with religions of course uh you know you, you try to get at the core truth of like christianity for example and you have this like this really beautiful idea but then very few people would actually be able to say that's what christianity is mostly would they be like oh yeah no all well, the christians are really mean to me 
Um, and that's because it's risen to a level of like ideological, um, you know, I, I call it like an ideological formation or whatever. But can you talk a little bit about like your, I don't want to call it political trajectory because it's not even what it was, but uh, well, let's use like kind of a almost Joseph Campbell sort of thing. Your journey, your hero's journey, yeah. Yeah, I guess, to where yeah. you are right now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that really illustrious introduction. I, I appreciate I, I, I it. I should have said more, actually. I, I should say more. Oh, I, I, you are... Thank you so much. And it's always nice to know that there are people who have been watching your journey for as long as like you have. So that's so kind of you. And, and I really appreciate it. Um, but I guess I guess to go back to what you're saying, like, I guess the reason why I it's been, I guess, easy for me to remain in this kind of object well I wouldn't necessarily say objective because obviously I have my own ideas about things but I guess kind of remain out of the fray is because I'm really not like invested in any way in any sort of ideology and at the same time the way I grew up was very kind of socially and historically disembedded like I'm of mixed heritage I grew up in a bunch of different countries everywhere I've gone I've always been some kind of like outsider so the idea of like hive mind or like fitting in or needing to sort of appeal to I guess the expectations of a specific group that's not something that's always been easy for me <laughs> um, but at the same time I have a deep understanding of it because I've had to adapt in order to survive I've had to adapt quickly mm. <coughs> because I've moved so much so I have this like weird understanding of human behavior in that sense um and how some of its more darker aspects can manifest especially when it comes to group dynamics so it's like very easy for me to see how they were beginning to manifest on the left Ooh. when i sort of started my journey there mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and how some of the things i had experienced like growing up interacting in different cultures um in different sort of religious orientations cultural orientations racial groups um how, and how these different tensions sort of arise so i guess maybe the reason why i haven't broken down is because it's something that i'm used to it's sort of a life path journey thing mm -hmm. it's sort of a thing that i've been saddled with that's like my cross to bear <laughs> in this lifetime so i just sort of see it as like an extension of that mm -hmm. um and it also made me realize that a lot of the ideological posturing that people do these days, especially online, has very little to do with actual intellectual, philosophical, moral conviction. It has everything to do with attempting to find a place to belong. Oh. Um, because the way that I grew up disembedded um, because of cultural reasons, because I've, I'm of mixed heritage, now everybody feels that way because... The neoliberal paradigm has sort of deterritorialized everyone. Mm. Um, so people are sort of desperately looking for a sense of false purpose to fill this void, uh, a prepackaged identity that they can sort of project themselves into that will give them friends, that will give them a milieu to signal to, a place to seek validation, a reassurance, a worldview, a philosophy, all of those different things. Um, and I feel like that's the reason why things are so like fraught and contentious. And it's also the reason why I take such a skeptical kind of like view of it. And I've sort of taken a back seat to it. Mm -hmm. And then the second, the second reason is because it's for spiritual reasons as well. Like um, spirituality has always been like a major interest of mine and anything that sort of me ex 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 bleh, excavating the political or cultural realm is usually inspired by like a spiritual interest of mine and one of the most like i guess profound spiritual lessons that i've had to learn because of how i've like grown up and stuff is this notion of the reconciliation of opposites um oh, yeah. the notion <laughs> the, the the notion that like in life uh life is made up of um opposites like everything in reality is made up of opposites and it's our natural proclivity to view everything as separated but everything kind of contain, contains the seed of its opposite and like i tend to look at life and culture in that way mm -hmm. and i believe that even when you're dealing with opposing forces there's always some element of reconciliation and that's like where i guess the meat of my cultural com commentary lines is lies is attempting to find that synthesis 
or attempting to unearth it because at the end of the day we're all human we're all sharing a human experience and the universal often gets lost now that everyone is like stratified into these political groups these identity groups um we've forgotten that we're literally all made up of the same thing (laughs) um so yeah i guess that's that's why (laughs) it occurs to me so you know uh, like you're definitely influenced by marxism but you're your view of that is, I feel like that's the core of the, the, the dialectic, the, the idea that, you know, that there is always, well, and that's also Jungian too. I mean, you know, there, there's the, 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 the shadow being the thing that you deny in the, in the whole, the thing that you cannot integrate. Oftentimes the shadow is the thing that you are most angry about in other people because it's the one thing about yourself you cannot in- integrate. And if you look at the, if you look at the majority of the, the political strife, uh, especially on social media, which is completely disembodied, there's no, there's no body yeah. involved. You know, we're all just yeah. like here and looking at really tiny screens and trying to, you know, like, have these human experiences on, yeah. you know, in, in contorted postures. But, but like, what's, what's the difference between like, for instance, a they, them influencer and like a trad Catholic e-girl? I think that both both of those things are manifestations of the same alienation, despite I, them being on drastic, um, I guess, aesthetic opposites in that sense, which is why I don't see the point of of taking these, I guess, infantile responses to modernity seriously. Right. Um, but it seems to be what everything is sort of centered around. Um, and a I, lot of other important stuff gets left out. Back, so I guess I'm a bit older than you, or I think a lot older yeah. than you. Um, I remember, there was this long period where I did not, um, and I still don't, I still do not have a television in the house at all. So I don't see commercials. There's Once in a great while, I'll see a commercial when I'm at someone else's house or at a restaurant and there's a television on or whatever. But mm. there was this point where I realized because I wasn't watching television, it seemed as if there was this way of talking and way of thinking that a lot of the people around me um, had that I didn't. Like it was something that I couldn't access. And I, and I my the the way I described it was that like wow, everyone's talking television. And and it's interesting because this is a there was a indigenous uh, story from uh, I, th- I believe it was a, an Alaskan uh, native who had discussed how. Um, you know, their children speak television and she doesn't know how to speak television. She, she knows English, but she doesn't know television. She doesn't know the way to think about the world and the way to speak about the world through that. And so that was decades ago for me. Wow, I am old. Um, but, but then, you know, the internet came about, social media came about. And when you're in social media, you start, it's subtle. You don't notice how it's training you to think. The only way that you can notice it is when you take a long break from it or when you're completely outside of it, where it seems like everyone is thinking in this, this way, this, this, this framework. It's, it's almost like they're speaking a completely different language, even though it's still your language. Yeah. Um, and and that, that is shaping the way that they think about themselves and especially the way they think about others as well. And I think on your point, you know, what is the difference between, you know, a non-binary influencer and a trad cath wife, or is it Catholic trad wife? I can't remember. But it, them both being created by the same larger paradigm, the same larger language, the, the same larger framework, um, even though they would consider themselves to be completely opposite of the other. But when you step out of it, you know, even if you are within the social media, you can still start to detect the similarity where it's like but you're still thinking the same way even though you're coming to what appear to to you to be different conclusions you you, you're still using the same mental processes Mm -hmm. and there are other mental processes that you could use um and and those mental processes i think are the ones that we develop from body from our actual lived experience not our Mm -hmm. virtual experience but so Mm -hmm. when you were talking about um, your experience not not feeling like you belong necessarily to one community or another to being um, 
Uh, actually, in the, the 90s, they used to call that a hybrid identity before inter intersectionality uh, came over uh, and, and replaced that. But hybrid identities were, uh, you know, African-American would be one example of it. But then also a, a person who, like a refugee, a Syrian refugee in, let's say, Luxembourg, where I live now, would have hybrid identities, whether Syrian identity or their Islamic identity was hybridized by their experience of being somewhere else. And it was constantly informing, shaping, changing those identities. And, 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 and there, was a, there was an extremely revolutionary root in that idea that never really took off. And I think that's why intersectionality uh, replaced yeah. it. Um, you replaced which it, was yeah. That it, it <laughs> which is why it makes me so mad. <laughs> yeah, and it, that's why and, it makes me so mad. And that an initial paradigm, like it's, it undermines identity itself. That it, it showed how identity oftentimes is merely a mask that we are putting on in order to feel like we are part of another group. Mm. And that identity was a you know, a, a, a kind of a false signifier of the actual human belonging that we were seeking. Um, I think, I think yes and no. I feel like this is where the whole synthesis of opposites comes in again, because on the left, you have people who see someone like me, for instance, as like the ideal modern subject, historically disembedded, um, without necessarily any allegiance to any sort of country nation <laughs> identity cosmopolitan um and although living that way has its benefits it also has its downsides someone on the right may say that uh this kind of rootless existence is why we have all of these like psychological maladies in modernity people feel as if they have nowhere to belong there's no sort of um shared um, values that bind us together, which makes us vulnerable to kind of grifters, and you see that happening now. Like there's, there's, we're in almost a messianic age, which is ironic because like we're in supposed to be entering the age of Aquarius, right? The age of Pisces is dead. Yeah, we are in a second messianic age with like the Andrew Tates of the world and all of these charismatic liver king guys coming around preaching their um, path to salvation. Um, yet. The reason why these kind th there's sort of been this like stratification is because yeah we don't have these unifying ideals anymore so anything goes so both of these perspectives have a point both of these perspectives have their ups and downs for me personally as somebody who is that kind of cosmopolitan modern subject it has its its benefits in the sense that it gives me insight into the human condition that a lot of people who have sort of stronger group allegiances are incapable of witnessing because that's their reality tunnel, as Robert Anton Wilson <laughs> would say. Whereas because my reality tunnel is far more dispersed, I can see multiple perspectives. But at the same time, it's alienating not to have a place to belong. It's alienating for me to go back to Nigeria and realize I'm not Nigerian. It's weird being in England and realizing I'm not actually like English when I go back to my boyfriend's house in the countryside and see all the hobbits. And I'm like, okay, these are like the real English people. I'm kind of just like a, am I a guest here? Like, what am I? Where do I belong? I, um, I, I totally not... want to segue real quick to Lady Hussey. <laughs> <laughs> but let's not. Let's and not. <laughs> the identity crisis, the identity crisis that I have at times is the same identity crisis that's going on in the West now. It's the same identity crisis that's going on in England at the moment, especially since the Queen died. What, what is England? What does it mean to be British? Who is really British? All of these different things. Um, and these are important questions. And I think that both perspectives kind of limit our ability to view, get to the bottom of things in that sense. Like on the left, they're like, we can't even ask the question. Cosmopolitanism is great. And anything that might be a downside whether it's alienation, whatever, we, we can't talk about it. Otherwise, you're enabling the bad guys or whatever. Um, and then on the right, you have, like, obviously incredibly extreme perspectives about what should be done about this alienation and things like that. So it's just like a, cl it's like a, cl it's a clusterfuck, and it's, like, impossible to really, I guess, get to that universal truth Mm -hmm. when the conversation is always so contentious on both sides, which is why I feel like there's no point, um, because you're also punished for not 
explicitly signaling to either either side oh, yeah. as well. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so, and then each side will think that you're siding with the other one. And yeah. So and then you, know, you get so yeah. And it's not, that's not to say that like <laughs> being a centrist is like this radically enlightened position either. Like centrists can be just as pig-headed and stuck in their reality tunnel um but i've been reading a lot of robert anton wilson lately and his notion of reality tunnels i think is like really imperative to this specific moment in history i might write something about it or make a video because i think it's like that really awesome. important yeah, uh yeah, yeah but we're all so definitely there's a i've written a little bit about this but uh giorgio agamben who he's he's italian he's He's a Marxist that Marxists don't trust, you know, the best kind of Marxist, basically. Um, you know, and a lot of the stuff that he brings up, too, is, is, is quite, uh, you know, it, it, his ideas resonate both with people who would consider themselves left and right. Um, but one of the things that he's brought up in a lot of his work is um, that there's this political overlay onto our lives that it's very hard for us to experience the opposite of it or not the opposite of it but but what's underneath what's under our actual what is our actual lived experience and then of course lived experience that has been weaponized as well where you know if you say you know like hey you're denying my lived experience you know that kind of thing you've seen all of that before on the internet but his concept of bare life is that you know there is this private human existence that humans have always known, and that's been the kind of the default state of humanity. However, in modernity, the the political realm, and and, and that's coming from the the Greek polis, the idea of this realm of the city that is extending over other parts of human life. That is so completely now integrated or the political has so fully taken hold of all of our ideas about ourselves that we forget that we are also, you know, humans. We, we forget that uh, there is this animal side to us and not, not like the feral savage sort of thing, but that we are physical beings that are living physical lives in relationship to other physical beings. Mm -hmm. And politics is just one way of understanding that. And mm -hmm. so, so that, that came up when, when you were talking about the, uh, you know, the, that's that the, the two ways or the two major frameworks that people are seeing the identity and the alienation problem. Uh, and, and looking for a universal, I, I think what I would, I would, that, that bare life is the universal experience. That is the, you know, we are all humans living lives. And everything else, everything else we think about each other, what we think about what other people are doing, what they believe, what, what we should believe, those are in a completely different realm of, of ideology that are constantly, that is constantly preventing us from having or connecting on that bare life. That on that universal, on that ground of being, as it were, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I, of course, that's that's one of the reasons why people don't like Agam and that, and he was also very critical of uh, the the COVID regimes everywhere, which of mm -hmm. course in Europe were much more intense than they ever were in the United States. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, <laughs> uh, and 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 he was in Italy, which was pretty much like ground zero for all of that, and he was like, hey, yeah. this is this is not what we should be doing. Hey, this is part yeah. of a much larger process. So that made people angry, but that's okay. I don't think he cares. Um, I don't well, <laughs> I don't, well, one kidding. of the ways in which, um, one of the ways in which this universal kind of ethos is like constantly rejected um, was like shown during the, the whole COVID thing. Like for instance, the fact that it was the right rather than the left that was like, showing skepticism on notions of yeah. of, of civic justice and civic uh, rights and things like that. Um, with one exception, same... with one exception, I was just reading, um, I, I, Dugald Hind, who was one of the, uh, the two people who founded the uh, Dark Manifesto, uh, or mm. the Dark Mountain Manifesto. Uh, I'm reading an advanced copy of his incredibly good book uh, called um, At Work in the Ruins. And he is... He was born in England. He lived in a, like, you know, the, the, the typical English life. And then he moved to Sweden uh, just before COVID. And he brought up that the, in Sweden, 
it was the the Greens and the Social Democrats who were pushing for the non-confinement, like the, the one country in the world that just didn't fall into the big, let's increase all of our government powers and tell everybody what to do, was the Swedish government. Um, the, the results of that were much better, you know, it, when you look at it, like they had no more problems and actually in many ways, many fewer problems than other places did. But it was there that the far right or the, the, the right wing part of their parliament was saying, no, 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 we need to increase uh, government authority. We need to be telling people what to do. So that was the, the one place where they didn't do this. The, the far right was acting the way that everyone is saying the far right was acting or that, that the liberal left establishment was. And I, and I think a lot of that is the who is in power and what were the decisions you know there was always someone doing that but of course they were you know here in luxembourg and, and france and germany the assumption was everybody who was against these extremely restrictive government measures these these controls on human movement human on bare life uh, the idea was only the far right could possibly have rejected that whereas it turns out in sweden it was the far right who was arguing that they should be doing that they should be restricting all of these things where it was the social democrats and the greens who were like, no, no, let's not do that. So that, that wasn't a universal thing. You, you can see that, and, and, and the fact that it was not universal points to the political manipulation, mostly from this you know, false center of the media telling you how you're supposed to think about the way other people are thinking about these things. And, and, and that's kind of controlled us in the same way that the, the social media narratives have of, you know, I, if you do not fit into this perfect identity, if you do not have this perfect identity, then you are nobody. Or, on the other hand, if you are not opposed completely to these people who have these identities, then you are a traitor to humanity or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so on the, 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 the topic of alienation as well, like you were, you were talking about Jung um, and about uh, the desert moment. Uh, this part of this discussion was before we started recording. But the the moment it seems like we are at right now, in general, and I think for most people, is the these political ideal ideologies do not work. Some people are are clinging to them harder and harder, the same way that. You know, Christian fundamentalism, for example, in the United States particularly, was a reaction to a moment of extreme crisis and extreme societal change uh, within the United States. You had people looking around, seeing everything seemed to be changing, so they, they clung as tightly as they could, too tightly, to the only thing that they knew, and ended up creating an ideology that was even more rigid than the fundamentals of that religion that they thought they were trying to save. You see the same sort of thing with, I think, Islamic fundamentalism, where um, all of the fundamentalist movements sprung up at moments of complete societal crisis, sometimes yeah. physical crisis where people are being bombed. And that same thing, we, we, we can look at it in religion, but, but that's also happening with politics, too, where people are you know, you have to be as completely this kind of leftist or this kind of rightist or this kind of whatever in order to save the world in order because everything is, is falling apart. So let's cling tighter and tighter until our our fingers go white, mm -hmm. our knuckles yeah, go white, and maybe our hands start to bleed because we're holding onto it too tight. Yeah, each of them is trying to claim ontological supremacy, which is the reason why um, right. it's, it's existential. It's no longer, like, even, like, you see it in the rhetoric that, like, in the last midterm elections that the Democrats were using the idea that democracy is at stake unless you vote for us and... Unless our party maintains power, then like everything's going to fall apart, and uh, you know all your rights are going to be taken away, and we're on the precipice of fascism, and therefore any measure that we take to maintain power is justified. Like, yeah, each each camp is attempting to claim, I guess, complete ontological supremacy, which used to be left to religion, but now politics is sort of uh, filling that kind of uh, filling that role. 
which I find yeah, really I, interesting. I, I recently wrote an essay, uh, not to promote my own stuff, but I just wrote an essay about the idea of crisis. You know, a crisis, it, the original Greek meaning of crisis was uh, the process of sieving, uh, when you're receiving through uh, taking out what you wanted and getting rid of the rest. And then later on, it, uh, its dominant idea, or its dominant meaning was that of um, sickness uh, or of health. Uh, you know, you were at a moment of crisis when a, or crisis when your illness could turn better or worse. After that point, you're either going to live or you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And and now everything is in crisis. Everything is constantly a, you know, democracy is going to be over if you do not vote for me, give me money. Um, or the immigrants are going to rape your women if you do not vote for us. Yeah. Or, you know, and it's just, just constantly on all sides, everything is constantly a crisis, but we see that same sort of idea of crisis in everything else. Yeah. Um, COVID was a crisis. Climate change yeah. is a crisis. And that's, yeah. that's not to say even for a second that climate change is not a problem. But the crisis idea, the moment of urgency, this, this emergency where you must, you must, it, it, there's almost an authoritarian impulse that you see in yeah, all of big these time. things where... Drop Surrender agency, doing. yeah. Surrender Follow your agency, me. yeah. Yeah, and right, Dangerous. left, religious, mm -hmm. non-religious. It's it's all been the same thing, but it's the reason why, even though everything is getting more conformist, restricted, there's like a huge safety culture. Things still feel crazier than they ever have. I right. don't know if you've noticed that feeling at all. Right. Um, right. And like you said, it's like. When somebody, when we are approaching that moment of free fall, or it feels like society is in free fall. People feel disembedded. People are searching for a sense of false purpose. So they attach all of their sort of ontological like impulses onto these like identity signifiers, political ideologies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's something that's I, it's dangerous on all ends, in my opinion. Um, you, you, each each side, I think everybody sort of knows that it's dangerous, but most people suppress that by being like, well, my side is right and I'm on the right side of history. So it doesn't matter if I notice these trends going on in my um, camp of the woods where my friends are and the right. people who... Um, I wonder if they, you know, if they deep down actually believe that or if they're just telling themselves that they believe that because, it's, because they're scared. You know, like, well, my, my side must be right. Um, in the same way that, like, you know, no, my, my parents said that this is true, so it must be true. Don't tell me anything else. You know, like, yeah. there's a, that's, that's the, the, you know, there's a conflict going on. Um, there's, there's a, a moment of transformation trying to happen, but instead they fall back on this other thing like, oh, no, 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 we're right. We yeah. must be right. We must be right. Um, you know, if, if we're not right, then everything's going to fall apart. And I can't think about that right now. I guess um, that's why Jung's desert metaphor um, really spoke to me because like we've been reading Red Book uh, I have like a book club with my podcast um, and yeah we've been re we just actually finished reading Red Book together and it was like this really profound experience like over the summer uh, when it was the hottest summer I've ever experienced in England uh, and I was kind of going through this kind of similar kind of Saturnian summer where a lot was changing and like a lot was shifting and like it really came at like a, the perfect time um, and yeah, this notion of like tra traversing one's depths and not being afraid to be out in the desert um, and stay there and, you know, work it until it blooms. Um, that's like the only way that one can like avoid false purpose. And anytime, anytime, like, you know, there's this sort of arch archetypal story of like a prophet in the desert, that's where the prophet is like tempted that's where, you know, he, the trickster shows up to try and lead him down a, right. a path of pleasure or a path of instant gratification. And mm -hmm. I think that a lot of people are having trouble becoming what I like to call desert flowers. Um, people can't, are not capable of being self-sustaining <laughs> entities. Um, but sure. the beautiful thing about the desert flower is that even though it seems like it's alone, it's still connected uh, through a network beneath the ground it's connected to all the other life um, so even though you might feel alone those universal aspects of the human condition connect you not just to like people in your vicinity but to everyone who's ever existed like throughout history and I feel like if people could only drop down into that like knowledge 
people would feel so much less afraid and so much less susceptible to being led down the path of false purpose. And like, I don't say that to be judgmental. Like I did it too, like with the left and stuff. And it took me going through the desert to like figure it out. Oh shit, like this is what I was looking for. This is the false purpose that I used as a way of trying to find, find that. Um, yeah. And that doesn't mean that like any interest in politics or philosophy or anything like that is false purpose. Absolutely not. Like these are things that will always be a part of my interests and my life. But the notion of kind of um, creating false senses of digital community that are rigidly policed and where ideology is sort of manufactured for certain political like that, that is, yeah, (laughs) that can stay out in the desert for sure. (laughs) Wait, it it occurs to me too. So, um, you know, deserts are much more full of life than than anyone who's yeah. not been to a desert thinks. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and the the kind of life within a desert, which tends to actually be a lot more a lot more varied than what you would see in more temperate areas, it, is this 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 you know it, it's it, there's a resilience to that sort of life, uh, which points to I think our own resilience beyond you know. Humans have been around much longer than empires have ever been around. Humans, you know, if you extend it back and back and back, you look at this universal, again, experience of this humanity that that keeps existing, keeps surviving, comes up with some ideas, discards them, realizes, "Mm, that that doesn't work anymore, I'm going to come up with a new idea. Um, or doesn't necessarily immediately learn from that uh, um, that experience and, and, and it messes things up really badly. Um, that, that, I think, is, is that desert moment as well. The, the, the idea that you know, there is something that we have existed as mm-hmm. and can keep existing as past all of these urgent present ideas these you know every ideology is screaming hey i'm in trouble Mm -hmm. uh hey you have to support me you have to bring me back if you don't bring me back if you do not vote you do not do you know whatever this is then yeah then everything is going to fall apart but yeah that that humanity underneath is is you know that is the desert but it isn't it isn't a bare um desolate place yeah it's a place where you you experience life more yeah more in a raw sense more yeah in a, what we are underneath all of these other things yeah definitely definitely and i guess the reason why red book was had such a profound effect on me as well is because i guess um part of my journey personally was like one out of like rigid like monotheism like i was raised in a very sort of conservative monotheistic household And as soon as I sort of could get my hands on any freedom, I was like out of there and sort of experimenting with anything I could get my hands on that gave me a sense of agency. Um, And I can't, there were aspects of that that were spiritually fulfilling, but also aspects where I felt terribly alone and sort of alienated at the same time. Um, It being, leaving monotheism behind puts you in a kind of, desert of your own a desert of uh, meaning that you then have to find and call and i feel like a lot of people once they do that don't actually do the work to reestablish something else they just yeah. kind of stay in the desert wandering from false purpose to false purpose which is yeah, well, precisely that's the, that's what the initial uh, so you know you and i both had that the, you know i was i was a christian fanatic really as an adolescent mm. like just completely oof. And, it's hard to imagine. There's that. <laughs> no, I, I have photos of me back then. I had, a, I had a mullet. I had a permed mullet, actually. It's, wow. It's, I don't. I don't know why I thought it, maybe it made me look more like Jesus <laughs> or something. But the the there's a tendency that when you when you leave these really strict paradigms in which everything is handed to you, everything mm-hmm. is handed to you. Everything, and, yeah. And there's an answer for everything. It's all right there. You might yeah. not understand those answers and you might not actually agree with those answers and you might actually find out that they're completely incoherent, but, but all of the answers are written out for you. So you don't have mm-hmm. to do anything. You don't have to think, you know, you know, and then when you start thinking and you start saying, mm, mm, this isn't always, mm-hmm. no, no, that's not right. The, the moment of leaving, it's really hard because the, 
you want to find another complete program. Yeah, you know, and you, you will never will, which book. is the thing. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> you never I will. <laughs> my, That's the thing. And, and I've seen this with so many other people, religious yeah. or or political, where you know there, there's this swing where if you go from like one leftist ideology, you know sometimes people will like, oh no no, this is all false. So I'm going to take the right wing play playbook now, and yeah. not realizing that. No, it's a playbook that's a problem. It's the yeah. rule book, the, the yeah. idea that there's a manual for these things. Yeah. That there's a manual yeah. for spiritual experiences or human existences. Exactly. And, and, and so hanging I think that's out a in the desert. Hanging out in the desert is like, you can have two experiences. You can either cultivate an oasis for yourself, become a desert flower, or you can continue to wander from false purpose to false purpose to false purpose until you eventually drop from exhaustion. And I mm -hmm. feel like that's what a lot of people do. And I guess the reason why Red Book had such a profound effect on me was because it's all about the union of opposites. And what Jung does in that is kind of reunify monotheism and paganism in a way. Mm -hmm. He finds all of these different motifs and um, universals. Um, and I guess it kind of made me want to look at some of the desert biblical metaphors again after years of not mm -hmm. looking at them. and. I forgot how profound the story of Moses actually like is. I forget how pro I forgot how profound the biblical stories generally were, mm -hmm. because as soon as I left it behind, I had like no interest in, I guess, yeah. reading it again. I saw it as like you know it's an it's a relic of the Piscean age. I'm an Aquarian. Um, fuck that shit. But I feel like the age of Aquarius is really about finding ways of synthesizing the Piscean age and our sort of more progressive Aquarian ideals, finding ways mm -hmm. of marrying those two things together, finding ways of honoring our past, honoring our history, honoring our roots, while also striving towards the future. And I guess the reason why I align with that ethos again is because of how I grew up as someone who didn't have a place to belong, who was in yeah. two sides, two worlds, but who could see the beauty of both. And because I am a synthesis of both, I guess my in ethos into the future and my hopes for like humanity are like a synthesis of, of both because there's beauty in modernity, there's beauty in tradition, there's beauty in all of these different things. And I don't think that either impulse can be nullified. Um, mm. So yeah, I feel I, like it all comes down to the unity at the end of the day. I, I, I love that because, you know, I, I said one, one time, um, and I don't know if I came up with it or someone else has come up with it, but we've, we've spent so much time trying to question, you know, binaries like the gender binary, but we, you know, we've never questioned the political ideological binaries. Like we've never, we've never questioned our idea that something must be completely true or completely false, that there's not, you know, multiple other ways of seeing those things. You're not allowed and, to do uh, that because there's too much vested interest in keeping the paradigms completely, like the reality tunnels, as Robert Anton Wilson would say, yeah. completely separated. There's way too much, vent like all the major news networks and corporate outlets would shut down if this right. sort of rigid binary, uh, all of Twitter's advertising money would run out. Um, so yeah, I feel like the reason why it's okay to like endlessly question gender and like, you know, create infinite reductions of that, but not necessarily look at the nuances of something like political perspectives is because, mm. yeah, there's an incentive for that not to be the case. Exactly, exactly. Hey, I, I think we could talk like four hours more. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting a little message from my, my uh, earbuds that are telling me that the battery is about to die, which means I won't be able to hear you in a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, anything else you want to add to this? Like, this has been fucking great. I, yeah, it's been awesome. I, I've always appreciated you. You are like one of my favorite people in the whole world. So. Oh my God, Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for inviting me on as well. I always have a, a great time talking to you. And we should do this again because it, Let's do it, it again. feels like there's lo lots more to talk about. <laughs> And then, then uh, you know, one more note, Gordon, if you're watching this, you and Angie need to meet because yes, be we, do. So. we do, we do, we <laughs> do. Um, well, thank you.
Thank you so much. I cannot hear you right now because my microphone has died, but I will just uh, tell everybody uh, this has been The Realign, the second episode with Angie. Uh, you can read Angie's works on Newsweek. Uh, she has a column there, which is really worth reading. Um, she also has an amazing YouTube channel, which I will add uh, the link and stuff for that. And then uh, this episode is also going to be available on her channel as well. So. Thank you so much again. And again, I cannot hear you, so, but you can say whatever you want. Uh, thank you and goodbye. <laughs> oh, bye I bye. can hear you in my right ear. Um, oh, you can. Anyway, okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop good. recording right now. Thank you for listening to The Realign. I'm Reed Woodworth. In this episode, I spoke with Angie of Angie Speaks. We discussed alienation and the journey beyond political ideologies to the shared existence of human life. Angie's columns can be found at Newsweek.com and you can also view her fascinating video series on her YouTube channel. Just search there for Angie Speaks. The Realign can be heard across all podcast networks or you can watch videos of episodes at From the Forest of Arduino. New episodes are released in advance to paid supporters and are then later released to the general public. To find out more, please visit read.substack.com. That's R-H-Y-D.substack.com.